Welcome to First Baptist Church. We are so glad that you are here today. Happy Father's Day. Please stand with us as we start our worship.
Amen. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Leadville. We're very excited that you're here with us this morning. And of course, happy Father's Day. Can we give our fathers a round of applause? <laughs> Praise God. Of course, our fathers here on earth are meant to reflect the glory of our Heavenly Father. We don't do so perfectly. We are very imperfect, all of us here on this earth. But we see a little bit about God when we see a good, loving Father. I'd like to start off with a little bit of a vision reminder for us, read and response. This is vision reminder number six. Once I get to the part in the white, let's read together. Our driving desire is that we would be disciples of Jesus Christ who obediently, obediently pursues spiritual growth and maturity by God's grace through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated here this morning. Now, I know some of you dads were excited when you saw the display out in the foyer, okay? But, but, we got to keep you around, okay? If we, if we just gave you your donut right away, we, we, everyone would be exodusing out the door, okay? So that's for after the service. It's something we have to look forward to. We've been going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the book of Hebrews, and we've been in chapter 10, and we're actually on part three of a very important section where we're talking about, really, the community that we have together, supporting one another, and seeking to persevere in the faith. This is something that's not easy. I've said it many times before. Christianity is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And so we've got to per persevere. We've got to push forward. We've got to move together towards the kingdom. And in light of that, I just want to read a short verse out of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says this. He says, Therefore, my beloved brothers... Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I love this passage. Sometimes our labor in the Lord feels like it is in vain. It feels like nobody sees what we're doing. It feels like it doesn't make a difference. It feels like I go through all of these things. I go through all of these trials and difficulties in life, and it doesn't even matter. That's kind of that Ecclesiastes feeling, right? That... It's meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. And yet, we persevere, we push on, we continue to move forward together as a community, knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. He says he sends out his word to accomplish his purpose, and it will not return to him void. It is actually going to succeed in accomplishing that for which it is designed. The conversion of sinners, the transformation of people's lives so that they repent of their sins and put their faith in Jesus. That's what it's all about, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to celebrate that, the fact that God changes us from within. He takes a heart of stone, he gives us a heart of flesh, and he sets us on the pathway of following his son, following in Jesus' way. That's what we're all here to do, and what I love about this verse is we are doing that together. Sometimes you may feel like you're stumbling, you're falling, right? We've had the marathons going up here this weekend. Sometimes somebody may fall down, and of course somebody stops. They try to pick them back up and help them keep going. Let's go. We can finish this. We can do this together. That's what we're all here to do. And that's something that I want us to remember as we're thinking about perseverance today. Before we jump into that, we are going to continue to worship God with our voices. We do believe here in this church that all of life is worship. Okay, and so you worship God on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc. But we also gather together in a special way to worship on Sunday, and we have a time of tithes and offerings. If you would like to give a tithe or an offering to the Lord, you can do so in the back in the offering box, or you can give online at fbcleadville.com/give. Please stand together with me, and we are going to continue to lift up our voices to the Lord. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, hallelujah. 
Father God, we thank you and praise you that you always provide a way for us, a means for us. Even though at times we feel lost, we feel like we don't know the way, we feel like we've wandered too far away, Lord God. You shine forth in your son Jesus, and he guides us on the path. We praise you and thank you for that truth, Lord God. And I pray this morning as we consider your word that you would open up our hearts and minds to perceive your truth. We thank you for all of your grace and mercy, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, musicians. You may be seated as well. At this time, I would like to dismiss the young ones, age three to five, to the back for Children's Church. And you can see some more information about our children's ministry in the lower left corner of your bulletin. Please open up with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. As you turn to Hebrews chapter 10, I just want to orient us to the text. This is actually part three of a three-part series that we've been doing on Hebrews 10 and verses 21 essentially all the way down through 39. This whole section is a section that should be taken together. 
it focuses on the ideas of the fact that we must persevere and we must not continue on in deliberate sin. Verse 26, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And so for the last three weeks, we've been talking about the implications of this truth for our lives. What does that actually mean? That there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Well, the author is trying to get into a very practical frame of mind, a very practical mode. The author wants us to walk in the truth of Jesus. He wants us to live like Jesus matters for our lives. And so because of that, he is giving these strong indictments against us so that we will live in light of the truth. And we've preached two sermons now, primarily on verses 26 through 31. And today, Lord willing, I hope to treat 32 down through 39. So please follow along with me in your Bibles as we read Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 and through 39. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Let's pray. You, our Lord and our God, are holy. Magnify your great name here this morning. Illumine our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that we might hear by faith Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Seems to me that in our day and age of instant gratification, anything that takes a long period of time, anything that takes perseverance, anything that takes many years or multiple years is something that is kind of shunted off to the side. Uh, I don't have the patience for that. I don't have the endurance for that. I don't think I could put myself into that day after day, week after week, year after year. But one of the things that our society absolutely accepts in terms of something that's going to take a very long time is the idea of getting a degree, getting a diploma. That training, that schooling takes an extremely long period of time, and people are often contented to just chip away at these things over many years. Betty Sanderson is a very interesting figure. She started getting her degree, and life came up. She was studying at the University of Minnesota, and she had to pause her education when she got married, but she never got lost her desire to finish her degree. She ended up graduating with her degree at age 84. 84. It took her nearly seven decades to complete her degree. She completed it in 67 years' time. But she just went after it. She kept going and she kept going. And they ran many articles of her at the time, you know, with titles like 84-year-old woman gets college degree after nearly seven decades. She kept working, she kept pushing, and Betty Sanison finally got her degree. She was willing to put in all of that time, effort, and energy. The reason I'm bringing this up is, although we may not have many areas in our day-to-day lives where we feel like we're persevering, we're doing something that is long-term, we're investing for the future, our relationship with God, our walk with Christ is precisely this. And in many ways, it mirrors the long efforts that it takes to get a degree many years over time. That is what we are doing in the faith. We're persevering, we're pressing forward, and we are continuing on, even though at times it feels like we're stuck. Even though at times, like with Betty, we feel like, man, I haven't made much progress on this degree over the last 10 years. It doesn't mean we have to stop there. It doesn't mean God has forgotten us. It just means today is our chance to step forward and continue to persevere. So today, I want us to think of this idea. Because we have faith and do not shrink back, that's what the text says, 
we should persevere through the various difficulties of life. We as a community have faith and do not shrink back, and therefore we should persevere through the difficulties of life. First, before I outline the difficulties, look with me at verses 38 and 39. 38 and 39 talk about this perseverance. But my righteous ones shall live by faith. We have faith. We are the righteous ones. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. God is telling us that we can persevere. We can press on. We are the righteous ones by the blood of Jesus. But if we shrink back, then his soul has no pleasure in us. So therefore, we can't shrink back. We must press forward. We must press on in faith, recognizing that our promised land is yet to come. Verse 39, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. That is the path for us. That is the opportunity that we have. If we will not shrink back and instead push forward, instead persevere, we will preserve our souls. But the problem is, in the first half of this section, you can see there are so many things getting in our way from persevering. There are so many difficulties that come at us in life that discourage us and try to get us to quit the road. They try to get us to turn away, to turn back. And of course, we know from the passage, we are destroyed if we turn back. And so I want to spend the rest of our time looking at three primary areas of difficulty in life. First, I want us to see material lack. We're going to see that in verse 34. We're going to struggle in this life through material lack. It's something that we're going to wrestle with. And because of that, that might cause us to shrink back. We don't want to, and we need to press through. But not only do we have material lack at times, we also have reproach and affliction. We're going to see that in verse 33. And that reproach and affliction coming from without, coming from others, from others out in the world, or from the devil, is going to try to... to try to get us to quit the path, and so that reproach and affliction is something we need to persevere through. Finally, hard struggles and suffering. We're going to see hard struggles and suffering in verse 32, and it's very, very clear that there are many different things that take the form of hard struggles and suffering, but because of that, we must push on. Finally, I want to end with the joyous heart that we see in verse 34. The challenge of all of this is to persevere not just in action, not just in form, not just outwardly, but instead to persevere and have a joyous heart along the way. That's one of the big challenges, and I think we'll see some encouragement in verse 34. And so that's the path we're headed on. I've entitled the sermon, Perseverance in the Face of Difficulty. And we're going to walk through these three areas of difficulties in life and how they affect our heart and what should we, we should do in light of it. So, first let's go ahead and look at material lack. Look with me at verse 34. In 34, you can see these Christians are struggling with material lack, and it's something that we have to wrestle with as well. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Down through the ages, Christians' relationship to the material world has been fraught with difficulties. If you go into the early church, even from the earliest times, you can see that we swing that pendulum back and forth down through the Christian ages over and over and over again. You have issues in the early church based upon texts like this, those in prison, right? You had compassion on those in prison. And so oftentimes in the early church, you maybe had people who were almost going out of their way to get incarcerated. Those who are in prison are in a higher state than me, so I need to do something to get myself thrown in jail for Christ. I need to suffer for him. And you have almost this martyr complex where that is the highest good. Let's all go out and try to get martyred for Jesus. Let's go out of our way to cause a ruckus, to stir people up, and in order to try and make a statement for Christ. And so people will take a text like this, and they'll overapply it to their lives and say, this is, this, this is the paradigm. This is how we should live. Deliberately seeking out persecution and difficulties and trials. We have done the same thing in Christian churches when it comes to material goods or possessions. So maybe there's not an obsession in Christian churches today to go ahead and get imprisoned for the Lord. But how many people refuse any sort of material help or support? They refuse any sort of financial situation. They almost go out of their way to put themselves in a financial burden or a financial stress. Why? Because they look at passages like the rich young ruler. 
And after all, Jesus told him to sell all of his possessions, give to the poor, and come follow him. I need to follow or walk in that mode. And so you have people who will absolutely try to live that way, thinking that they're more righteous, they're more holy, by virtue of the fact that they are shunting the material things of the world, and they're saying, this isn't important, I don't care about this, I'm not focused on this. You have these types of dynamics down through church ages, all the way to the point of philosophy. In the early church, there were Gnostic tendencies within the church. Gnosticism is a broad field with many different ideas and positions, but one of the things that many Gnostics agreed upon was that the material world itself was evil and the spiritual world itself was good. Some would even go so far as to say that Jesus never took on flesh. Why? Because the material world is evil and Jesus is not evil. This is an early heresy called docetism, okay? And they taught that Jesus didn't take on flesh. There was a, an old parable that you'd be walking along the beach with Jesus and when you turn back and look around, you only see one set of footprints. Why? Because Jesus didn't have a material body. He seemed real to you, but he couldn't have a material body because we're pre-committed against the material things of this world. So there's all of these tendencies when it comes to material lack. And talking about material lack in the West, where many of us are more well-off than kings were a thousand years ago, some kings would kill to live like just a middle-class person today, it can be difficult to get your arms around this sense of material lack. But I actually propose to you this morning that focusing on the material goods themselves is a red herring, okay? Focusing on how much money's in the bank, focusing on what kinds of things we have, do we have nice things and all of that type of stuff, it's a red herring. It's actually not the issue, okay? Remember that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, a lot of people say money is the root of all evil, right? That's a shorthand that's leaving out a couple of important words. It's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. Look it up and you'll see it says what I'm telling you. And so, if it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil, I submit to you this morning that the material goods themselves don't matter. They're irrelevant. Instead, it's the attachment that the individual places on the material goods. What is your relationship to the material goods that matters most? Your relationship to the material goods is really what is pulling you away from the Lord. Listen to what Job says in Job 121 after he is told he's lost so much of his material goods, friends, family, etc. Job says, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord gives, the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. There's a very important principle for Westerners in those words. Job was rich by all measures. He was one of the richest men in his day, and yet he had no attachment to those things. He ends up telling his wife, shall we accept good things from the Lord but not bad things? Shall we say, oh, we only want blessings, Lord, but whenever you give us a trial or a difficulty, now we're going to go ahead and shake our fist at heaven? Of course not, says Job. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job is not affected by the amount of material goods he has because he's unattached to them. He just wants to use them for God and for his kingdom and for his purpose. My know thy enemy this morning is on this topic. I think this is so, so important. You have two essential ideas when it comes to material goods and things in the world. You have a Buddhistic or a Stoic mentality. Buddhism and Stoicism says, all of life is suffering, and the reason you're suffering is because you have attachment to things. You desire things. Your suffering is because of your desires. Rather than trying to get all of these things, says Buddhism, instead, get rid of your desires. If you got rid of your desires, then you would no longer suffer because you're no longer attached to these things. Stoicism has a similar state or frame of mind where it says you need to stop struggling or striving against the world and just accept and embrace what fate has brought your way. And if you're in that state, then you're no longer going to be suffering in this way. This is a very attractive philosophy and doctrine for many people these days. But on the other side of the coin is hedonism, okay? Hedonism says you only go around once in life, so grab for all the gusto you can get, right? You're only here one time, you know, for several decades, and you better do everything you can to have a, a ball while you're here. Because once we die, we're dead. That's it. It's over. So have the most fun you can while you're here. And these are two sides that are both wrong, okay? Both of these sides are actually pulling everything out in an extremist fashion. They're reductionistic in the way they're approaching these things. 
I've shared this story before, but I remember Tim Keller was talking about he was interacting with a Buddhist woman in one of his congregations. And she really desperately wanted to see her daughter again. Her daughter and her were estranged. They didn't have a good relationship. And yet at the same time, she had a Buddhistic philosophy or mentality. So she felt bad that she wanted to see her daughter again. She felt bad that she actually desired that because it was causing her suffering. And Tim Keller says he went to her and he said, your philosophy of life is not really working well for you now, is it? These are both extremes. They're reductionistic. And so if I was to put both of these on a continuum, you would see hedonism on the far side, throw yourself into the material world because it's, it's so pleasurable, or Buddhism on the other side. Get rid of all of your materialistic tendencies. Get rid of your attachment to materialism, etc. Buddhism looks very, very similar to the Gnosticism that I shared earlier, right? The material world is bad or evil. Separate from it and become one with the divine. Now, some of you guys might have used this phrase before, might have heard people use this phrase before. Everything in moderation, okay? And that feels like a really nice, happy medium between these two, right? Everything in moderation essentially says, you know, I'm not going to go too far in the Buddhistic direction and try to detach myself entirely from the world, but I'm not going to go too far in the hedonistic direction either and be throwing myself into material pleasures and material goods. And again, I want you to know this is a hard thing for Christians to wrestle with because we see clearly in the incarnation that God loves the material world. God loves the body. God loves what, what we're doing down here on earth. This is actually something that was good. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. After he creates every single thing, he saw that it was very good. He saw that it was very good. God's primary design is not for us to somehow get rid of the material world and pretend it doesn't exist or remove ourselves from it. Somehow we're meant to integrate it. Now, we live in a fallen world, so there are problems or difficulties with what we're doing, but the world is still a material world that God expects us to navigate. It's at this point that I want to suggest to you that everything in moderation is a good approximation of the truth, but it's just an approximation. I don't think that's the real answer. The real answer is more complicated. And I'm going to be honest with you. I hesitate to share this with you because I think it is difficult to apply well in life. And I think if somebody was not applying this well, they might actually make greater shipwreck of their faith than if they just practiced everything in moderation. But here's what I think the real answer is. I think the real answer is that we take hedonism and Buddhism and we bring them together. And I don't mean Buddhism as a full religion. I just mean that impetus to try and separate yourself from worldly or material things. Okay? We, at the same time, all at once, should be dramatically enjoying God's world hedonism, while also at the same time having no attachment to the things here in God's world. The Lord gives, the Lord, blessed, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. So I can enjoy all of the material goods and things that he brings my way, but I'm not attached to them, and if he takes them away, that's fine. And I'm not tying into them in such a way that I am lusting after them or I'm glut, gluttonously subsuming them underneath myself. Instead, it's a dynamic where I, I, I want to say, let's both end this. Let's take both ideas, non-attached to material things, and yet enjoying all of the material things that God has to give us and bringing them together under one banner. John Piper talks about this a little bit. He doesn't use the exact same language I just did, but he calls this Christian hedonism, okay? And this Christian hedonism idea is we are not meant to diminish our joys. We're not meant to diminish our loves. We're instead meant to bring those under the banner of Christ and find full joy and full love and full satisfaction in him and all of the gifts that he has given us. But at the same time, if I remain attached to these things, if I remain stuck to them, oh, these are just good things from the Lord. I'm just enjoying what the Lord has given me. But in reality, in my heart, I have to have them. They're mine then I have fallen into the trap of the rich young ruler. And so what would Jesus tell to me then? Go and sell all you have and give to the poor. Then come and follow me. Why? Because I'm attached. I'm stuck. I'm focused on these things. So I think Christian hedonism transcends everything in moderation. I think it goes above and beyond, and it actually calls us to live a greater, fuller, richer life than just everything in moderation does. But I do want you to know that I'm not saying everything in moderation is wrong. What I have described here in Christian hedonism is nuanced. 
It is something that not everyone can apply. Some people in their lives, they need sharp lines in the sand so that they can walk firmly for the Lord and they have a clear pathway to go on. If I'm muddying your waters by saying Christian hedonism and bringing all this together, I'm happy for you to retreat into everything in moderation. But I want you to know it's an approximation. It's not the reality. Okay? And I believe this is what we're truly struggling with when it comes to material lack. What this says is, God, I am happy I'm not in jail for Christ. However, if you threw me in jail for Christ, I would be happy too. I can take whatever you have brought my way. I can fully embrace with open arms everything you have for me in this life. Sure, where I'm at now, where I would like to be, I enjoy that. I love that. I thank you, Lord, for all of the blessings you have showered upon me. But... If you took all this away from me, my faith and trust in you would not be moved one inch because I love you, I know you're good, and everything you bring my way is for my good and your glory. I'm committed to that from the outset, and so I'll enjoy what you've given me here, but I'm not attached to it, Lord. You can take it all away, and I will serve you just as much. My faith will not be shaken. I will not waver. This is how Western Christians today need to deal with material lack. We're not concerned with the number of goods you have. I don't care about the numbers in your bank account. I don't care if they're high, if they're low, all of those things. What I care about is your attachment to these things. And can you say, I delight in the things that the Lord has given me, but he could take them all away. It's all in his hands. Everything my father does is right and good. That is how we should wrestle with material lack. But that's not the only thing I want us to think about here. I also want us to see the reproach and affliction. The reproach and affliction we see that we're going to struggle with, something that's going to cause us or try to push us back from persevering in the way, is verse 33. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. This is going to happen to you. You may be publicly exposed. Notice that the text is broken down in two pieces. You can be publicly exposed, or you can be treated as being publicly exposed with those who are undergoing that issue. Two different parts here, both in verse 33. James Thompson puts it this way. I think it's helpful to understand the underlying Greek word here, this publicly exposed, okay? Publicly exposed, James Thompson says this. This comes from the Greek theaterazine. Okay, listen to what you hear. Theatra raidzine. What are you hearing there? Theater, theater, publicly exposed, put on stage as a show. That's the underlying word there. Literally to act in the theater takes on the metaphorical meaning of expose publicly. It focuses on public disgrace. That's what this publicly exposed word is, that public disgrace. And specifically, of course, for following Christ. We're following Christ, and it's bringing us up to public shame and exposure. Al Mohler says this. He says, identifying with Jesus will, in a world that does not want him as king, will mean that we become victims of verbal abuse, mockery, and shame in the public square. And I think many of us have experienced that. Maybe not on the degree that those in the early church were, but we've experienced it. Shame, ridicule, mockery for your beliefs as a Christian. The fact that you're going out of your way to follow Christ and live for him is actually something that is bringing pressure from the outside. And that pressure is, we're going to shame you and mock you so that you won't advance your ideas or views in public. I think we all know that there's certain things we're a little hesitant to say in mixed company. We might be hesitant to say in the business meeting. We might be hesitant to share if we're not 100% sure where our new friends are at. So we're a little bit hesitant with our conversation, with our language, okay? Now, what can we do about reproach and affliction? I want this to be very practical. We know that there is a basic impulse or pushing against us as Christians in a cultural way. What can we do about that? You must cultivate in yourself a deep and thoughtful conviction about the truth in any situation, okay? And you, you almost have to do this ahead of time. If you try to do it in the moment, oh, I'm being pressured now, you, you've got feelings and emotions and everything is happening, you're getting ca caught flat-footed and you're likely not to succeed, okay? But if you've thought about it ahead of time, what if this were to happen? What if I was to get asked this question? How would I respond? What would I do? Then you won't be manipulated because you've already thought this thing through. 
If I'm going to get pressured in this way, this is how I'm going to react and respond. This is the godly way, okay? You need to have that deep-held conviction ahead of time. You need to know this is what God would have me to do if this situation were to come up. For example, if you work in a financial department of a business or organization, if my business were to ask me to cook the books, if they were to ask me to, you know, fiddle with the numbers a little bit, what would I do? What would I say? How am I going to respond? Okay? Or what, what if my boss in a particular context or situation tells me that oh, we don't need to report that spill. We don't need to report that safety incident. What am I going to do? What am I going to say? How am I going to respond? If you've thought ahead of time, then you will not be shaken in the moment. Now, those are specific things, but this also works as your inherent disposition to life as a Christian. You're going to run into difficult situations and circumstances, and I want you to know ahead of time, these are my convictions, and this is what I'm following in. Okay? It's very, very important for us so that we don't allow the reproach and affliction to cause us to shrink back because we are not of those who shrink back. But this may not only affect you directly, it might affect you indirectly as well. Again, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and afflict, excuse me, affliction, that's you, but also the next one, and sometimes being partners with those who are so treated. This could happen to others, and you are going to have to decide where you stand. For us as Christians, this is not being ashamed of being identified with other people. I don't, I don't know if you remember the situation with Paul and Peter, but Peter would go off and eat with the Gentiles, and then his Jewish Christian friends would come along, and he would completely change tack. He, he would run over and eat with the Jews and blah, 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 and, you know, he was trying to play both sides, right? And Paul publicly rebukes him and says, you're playing both sides. Why are you doing this? Okay, if we don't have to follow the rules of the Old Testament as Christians, then don't follow them and have the courage of your convictions to stand up and show that publicly in front of others rather than running back and forth and playing both sides. Same thing goes for us. Are we afraid to be identified as Christians? Or maybe we have a friend or a family member who has a Christian conviction. Are we afraid to be identified with them? Now, I'm not saying that if they're a bull in a china shop, you don't come along and, you know, try to navigate it in a little bit more nuanced fashion. That might work. That might be helpful. But just that fundamental shame of association, I don't want to be associated with them. We need to ask ourselves that question if we're falling victim to this. These reproaches and afflictions are going to happen. They happen to Jesus. They're going to happen to us, okay? This is the nature of living in a fallen world and trying to live in a countercultural way. Jesus said this in John 16, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's a very encouraging passage because he says, in this world we, have, we will have tribulation, it's going to happen, but take heart because he has overcome the world. Let's go on now to verse 32 and the hard struggles and suffering. Hard struggles and suffering suffering. Verse 32, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. I think hard struggle and sufferings is an interesting idea to dig into. Dennis Johnson points out that this is athletic terminology that's being used here, all right? In Greek, the word struggle is actually athlesis, right? Which means athletic, right? It's this struggle in the physical form, Dennis Johnson says it has overtones of both military combat and sports. And he says these activities are closely connected in the Hellenistic world. And so we kind of have an athletic motif going on here. And we need, the idea is we need to press through even though things are hard and difficult, even though there are trials, even though it's a hard struggle and there is suffering, we instead need to press on and to move forward. In our day and age, we don't have a lot of, oh, this is, <laughs> I skipped this one, I'm sorry. This is being mocked in the theater, guys. You're going you're gonna to get that, okay? They're going to throw tomatoes and lettuce at you, all right? It is what it is. I skipped that, sorry. This one is the hard struggle and suffering. I don't know if you guys know about this competition. This is called the Tough Mudder, okay? The Tough Mudder. And they put together this whole obstacle course. You have a team, you're working together, and you're crawling through the mud. I mean, does she look like she's struggling or what? 
Yes, hard struggles and suffering. I do not know why anyone would voluntarily subject themselves to this, okay? You signed up to do this. You paid money to crawl through the mud, right? Like, p- people have come to me before, and they're like, we're putting together a Tough Mudder team. Do you want to be on our Tough Mudder team? I'm like, in what, in what universe would you think I wanted to be in, on your Tough Mudder team? That's, that's wild. Anyway, you might like that. If that's your thing, good for you. God bless you. It's just not my thing, okay? But it's this hard struggle, this suffering. And the reason I bring this up, I mean, we've, we've got marathons going on right now here in town. People are constantly signing up for things like Iron Man and different things like that. We want to push our bodies. We want to push them to the limits. But sometimes I wonder, why are we engaging in these activities, okay? Sometimes I think that we fail to see true adversity or we don't sense that we're experiencing true adversity in our lives, and so we're almost trying to, like, make up for it, right? Like, it's like, man, my life, in my life, I don't have to grit my teeth and grunt and growl and run as hard as I can and, you know, anything like that. And so there's this sense in which I just feel like I'm languishing as a person, as a human being. And so instead, I'm going to throw myself into a tough, difficult, athletic competition so I can get that sense of um, I'm alive, right? That, that kind of thing. And, and I think a lot of people feel that way or engage in that way. But, but it's at this point that I want to talk about something, okay? Oftentimes, you'll be talking about a struggle, a hard trial or struggle in your life, suffering in your life. And um, somebody will say this, or you'll maybe say this, you'll say, first world problems. I know, I know, first world problems, right? Whenever you describe something that's going on and difficult for you, and, and, and it's almost like this, there are people dying of starvation, and who are you to complain about you lost your puppy, or, or something like that. And, and people will say that, first world problems. But the reason I'm bringing this up is, I want you to know that difficulties and trials, hard struggles and sufferings come in all shapes and sizes. And I want you to know that first world problems are real problems, okay? It's not your fault you were born in the first world. Like, what are you going to do about that? I am thoroughly convinced, I've said this before, but every problem, trial, struggle we come across in our lives are divinely ordained so that we will become more like Jesus, And if God can do that in your first world problems, he can also do it in the third world problems. Everybody has problems, and your job is not to fix your problems or to come up with worse problems. Your job is instead to work through your problems, trusting in the Lord. It's not like you picked them, okay? Right? I can can think of like a stereotypical, you know, princess girl never broke a nail, and she loses her little chihuahua, and she's freaking out, right? She, She has... She's at a fork in the road. She has a decision. Is she going to persevere through her hard struggle and suffering? Who am I to stand from the outside and be like, she has so much, and and that's such a little thing, and I can't believe she can't work through. Who am I, right? That's a struggle for her. It's a hard struggle. It's suffering. Let's hope that she perseveres through it, and she grows. And then maybe God will bring another trial her way, and another struggle. And through the course of her life, she might grow in such a way that you'd be astonished when you see her later on in life. I'm not going to sit here and judge the problem God brought her in her life. Instead, I got my own problems to deal with. I got a bunch of them in front of me. First world, third world, I don't know. There's problems. I need to fix them in the Lord and then move forward. That's what I need to do. I I don't understand this mentality of I'm going to look at everyone else's problems and like rank them and judge them as though you had some sort of, I don't know, arbiter of the universe perspective. You're able to look down and, you know, that person's really not, you know, they they have it easy and yet they're complaining. I don't know whether, no, no. You have problems, work through them in the Lord and grow. And somebody else has different problems than you, they need to work through them in the Lord and grow. That's why we're all here, to be like Jesus. And if God ordains certain problems for you and certain problems for somebody else, to their own master they stand and fall. You work on yours, okay? That's your job. Sorry, I'm preaching. (laughs) Let's move on to joyous heart. Okay, joyous heart, verse 34a. 34a, what does it say? For you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. I think this is an amazing idea, this idea of a joyous heart. George Guthrie puts it this way, and and just listen to this context. Once you understand this context, I think it's so helpful. He says, if the eviction from Rome in AD 49 is the social setting behind the author's reminder. The confiscation of property attending at an eviction would be in mind here. 
At various times in the first century, the Jews were publicly abused as a group, and after being evicted from their homes, they witnessed widespread looting of their properties and possessions. This is what's going on with early Christians and early converts to Christ in the Roman Empire. You would be persecuted for your faith, your house would be confiscated, and they would loot all your possessions. You have nothing now. And what is the author saying? You joyfully accepted this state of affairs. You joyfully embraced the fact that you were being looted. You said, if, if we're persecuted for Christ, blessed be the name of the Lord. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Thomas Long puts it this way. He says, the imprisonment of others became not an occasion for despair, but for the formation of a prison ministry. The loss of possessions did not prompt them to cry, we've lost everything. But instead, they cried out, we possess a treasure that the world cannot take. In other words, the congregation sang no dismal songs of victimhood, but a triumphant hymn of praise. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Amen. That is the spirit and attitude that we can have if we look to the heavens in our lives. It's so easy to get constrained down here. It's so easy to have the blinders on and just focus on everything that's going wrong in my day-to-day -day life. But the godly perspective, the heavenly perspective, that allows us to push forward and to move on even through these difficulties and trials of life. And we recognize goods and kindred can go. This mortal life can go as well. The body they can kill. God's truth abides still, and his kingdom is forever. That is our heartbeat. That is our focus. Who cares about stuff? Stuff is good insofar as it can be used as a tool to make you or others like Christ. Period. That's what stuff is for. That's its only purpose. And so you gather together as a group, and you're eating food and enjoying the blessings of the Lord. Good. That's a proper application and use of stuff. But if you are taking it together and you're saying, I need this, I have to get that, this is going to make me happy, and you're just spinning and focusing on getting things, you will be disappointed. That's all there is to it. 36 and 37, I think a great conclusion to this. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. Here we get a call to endure with hope, to continue to press forward, hoping for the life to come. We are not as those who struggle and labor, cry and fail with no hope. It's not as though we look at our lives and we say, there's nothing beyond this. This is all we've got. Instead, we press forward, enduring with great hope because we know something greater lies beyond. A, a quote that I've heard before, hope is grief's best music. Hope is grief's best music. Listen to that. If you're grieving, if you're struggling, if you have trials, if you have difficulties in life that you need to persevere through, hope is grief's best music. If you can have hope, if you can look into the word, if you can read the promises of the Lord to you for your life, that will give you hope, and that will drag you out of the pit of despair. That music will keep you going. It will keep you pressing on. Thomas Brooks says, hope can see heaven through the thickest clouds. You've got those thick clouds. It's a fog. You can't see anywhere. Hope is what allows you to pierce through the darkness and see into the light beyond. Heaven is up there. The clouds are thick, but I can see it beyond because I have hope. And that hope allows me to have a vision of the divine. That is what we are leaning into. And that hope allows us, causes us to persevere even in the midst of trial. Betty Sanderson didn't give up. There she is. She got her diploma. Look how happy she is. She persevered 67 years to get that degree. She persevered, pressed on, and she got her degree. She got the diploma. And that's the same thing that every single one of us is doing spiritually. Persevering, pressing on. We might take a class and fail. It doesn't mean I'm done with my degree. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to take another class. I'm going to try to make up for it. I'm going to work hard on these assignments. It's going to take so much time, effort, and energy. But God is constantly bringing these things in my life so that I will have finished the credit hours. I am a worker that needs not be ashamed. And I can enter into the joy of the Lord. Well done, good and faithful 
servant. Let's pray. You, our Lord and our God, are holy. We thank you so much for all of the grace and mercy you have shed upon us, Lord God. We thank you for enlightening our minds by your word, and I pray that you would give us guidance and direction in our lives. Please help us to know your truth, your will, your word for our lives, that we might take the unique step that you would have for each and every one of us, and that you would be glorified in all that we do, and you would receive all of the praise Do your name. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and move on to announcements. All right, happening today, after the service, we are having a short trustees meeting. Should be brief, just going over some of the logistics. And then we're trying to head over to Ice Palace Park for the Father's Day barbecue at noon. Some of you already told me, look at the sky. What's going on over there, right? Pray, all right? I want you to pray on your drive, but also hope, right? Just get, go over to Ice Palace Park, praying, and the clouds will part. I don't know that. I'm not a prophet, all right? Um, we'll, we'll trust in the Lord, and whatever, we, let's not get attached, okay? Whatever he brings our way, we embrace, and we'll figure out how to embrace it. So that's what we're doing right after the service for Father's Day. Also, of course, dads, on your way out, get your donuts, okay? That's going to be good stuff. Worship team practice, 3 p.m., if you're on the team next week. And then also there's a service opportunity for the cleaning crew. Yes, I've got it right here. And this is for the cleaning crew, okay, um, for June. Now I want you to know there's a lot of people sign up on this, but that doesn't mean you can't sign up, okay? Um, we could always use more help. We were signing up. Many people were signing up multiple times because they saw a need, all right? But if you step in and, and you want to help fulfill that need, that, that's going to be great, okay? So you can feel free to sign up, and we'd appreciate that. All righty. This week, tomorrow we have our men's discipleship cohort here at the church at 6.30 p.m. down in the fireside room. We chat with one another, pray for each other, and support each other. Um, very, very casual time of getting to know each other a little better. And then Wednesday, we have our teen Bible study here at the church at 6 p.m. And then Thursday, we're doing our prayer for our country and our leaders, and Tina Wood has been heading that up. So see her if you have any questions or you need some more details. Finally, I haven't been a, doing a good job of announcing this, but we have a men's preaching and teaching group, okay? And this was just, I kind of went up to a handful of men. I said, hey, uh, we, sh we should talk about this. And, and it's just me talking about my philosophy of preaching and teaching and all that type of stuff. If you have any interest in that, you're more than welcome to attend, okay? So it's kind of been like a little underground group up until now, but I want everyone to know you're invited, okay? I just, I just talked to individual men that I thought might be interested. That's at 3 p.m., and it's going to be on Saturday. July 3rd, we have our Communion Sunday and Potluck at the Woods, okay? And we typically do that around 4th of July. We do a, a big barbecue and potluck over at the Woods, and that will be July 3rd. July 10th, we have our Teen Water Wars activity, and July 18th to 22nd, we have our VBS, and that's a, that's a pretty big deal, okay? Please volunteer for that to do something. There's going to be a lot of activity here this week during VBS week. Finally, this week, we just talked about this in our leadership meeting. I am going to be ordained, Lord willing, July 31st, okay? We want to make it a big to-do. I'm going to have one of the people on the ordination council, one of my professors, Dr. Nicholas Reed. He's an expert in ancient Sumerian languages and, and things like that. He's going to preach the service, and then he's going to be on the council. I talked to Andrew Scott. Andrew Scott should be able to come back and be on the ordination council as well. And so we kind of want to make it a big to-do. We'll have a normal service, and then after the service, We'll try to have some food available, and, um, you know, I get grilled. It's like a Q&A on steroids, okay? That's what it is. And so, um, yeah, we'll be doing that for hours in the afternoon, Lord willing. July 18th to 22nd, we have VBS coming up. I just mentioned that. And it's uh, Australian theme, get your shirts. Finally, we, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you want to be baptized, you want to be involved in counseling, or you want to serve in some way, shape, or form, pull off the, on the back of your bulletin, pull off that sheet, Write down your name and all your info on there and drop it in the offering box. That'll make its way to me, okay? If I could have the worship team come back up, please everyone stand together with me, and we are going to um, finish off with a final song of praise.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.